Giving him the note to sign, saying that Trump is in, in excellent physical shape. He's the greatest person, greatest physical specimen that will ever take the office of the presidency. But how do you know you didn't do a medical exam with George Washington or Andrew Jackson? How would you know, right? Anyway, so that guy was a goofball, and that I don't trust what that doctor says at all. But in this case, he was asking the White House doctor, which is Dr. Ronnie Jackson. Now, Dr. Jackson is not attached to Donald Trump, his campaign, or his team. In fact, he was also the same doctor that did the physical of Barack Obama. So Trump comes up to him and says, yeah, okay, yeah, go ahead and test me. And Dr. Jackson says, are you sure? <laughs> this happened last week, and he's like, no, no, I'm sure. Let's go. We're going to test uh, both my physical and mental acuity. He's like, all right, be careful what you wish for. So they go to test him. So let's look at his vitals. He's six foot three. That's what you know. That's what he used to say, and we thought maybe he was inflating it. But I mean, Dr. Ronnie Jackson tested him. Okay, six foot three. Okay, that's the least controversial, least interesting part. So how how much does he weigh? Two hundred thirty nine pounds. I'm actually surprised by that. He looks a lot more than two thirty nine, but apparently two thirty nine it is. Okay, bless his heart. How's he doing on other vitals? Trump's resting heart rate was sixty eight. And blood pressure was 122 over 74. Well, that's really, really good. <laughs> Especially for a guy his age and for what he eats. It's like, if this was not an actual doctor that we know from the past that has served at the White House under other administrations, there's no way I'd believe it, knowing Trump's record. But apparently it's true. And Dr. Ronnie Jackson says he is in quote, Excellent health. Huh. That colored me surprised. Okay, well, it is what it is, though. You see, we don't change our opinions based on, um, uh, you know, what we want to happen. It is what it is, right? So, and by the way, I don't begrudge him that he's in good physical shape. Bless his heart. That's not an issue at all. Uh, in fact, Dr. Ronnie Jackson had something funny to say because the reporters, including John the Carl from ABC News, were as incredulous as I was when they first heard the story. Uh, we're going to get the mental fitness in a second, but one last thing about physical fitness. Listen. Can you explain to me how a guy who eats McDonald's and fried chicken and all those diet cokes and who never exercises is in as good a shape as you say he's in? It's called genetics. I don't know. It's uh, some people have uh, you know just great genes. You know, uh, I told the president that if he had a healthier diet over the last uh, twenty years, he might live to be two hundred years old. I don't know. I mean, uh, he uh, he has incredible uh, he has incredible genes. I just assume. All right. Uh, by the way, Trump is probably beside himself with joy on that. First of all, good. He's healthy, so he should be happy about that. <laughs> Second of all, when he talked about his good genes, he's like, oh, yeah. During the campaign, I uh, read all into Trump's history. And throughout his life, he has kept talking about how great his genes are because of where he comes from. Tick tock, tick tock, until Trump gets himself in trouble with talking about how great his genes are. But okay, for in the case of. Uh, uh, physical fitness, that is true. Okay? Now, mental fitness. This ought to be interesting. So they're not going to test them on intelligence, which would have been awesome. <laughs> but there's no doctor who's going to test them on intelligence. This is just to see, is he losing it? Does he have any signs of early dementia, Alzheimer's, stuff like that? So it's kind of a bold gambit on Trump's part to, to go for this. And I think this part is relevant. So, Jackson told reporters that Trump scored Wow, a 30 out of 30 on the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, which according to its website is a cognitive screening test designed to assist health professionals in the detection of mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. So, he doesn't have it. In fact, Dr. Jackson said, I have no concerns about his cognitive ability. Okay. So, I, I trust Dr. Ronnie Jackson. I don't see any of me sweating up a storm. Little lights, I don't know, any pressure or anything like that, but I have no reason to believe that at all. So, it, well, that conversation is over. Now, um, that leads to the next question. I'm not sure this was a smart thing for Donald Trump to do, because if you remember, one of his outs is, oh, golly gee, did you catch me with money laundering for the Russians? I guess I have early set dementia. That's why I was saying the stupid things I was. I got to go. Doctor tells me I got to go. Now, that's the old Vincent the Chin Gigante excuse, uh, you know, walking around in a bathrobe uh, saying, no, no, don't put me in prison because uh, I've lost my mind. 
Well, you just took that excuse away, and I'm not sure that was a smart move. So I'm definitely worried about this, and I'll tell you why. Because I ne- I didn't believe it, and if you watch the show, uh, I have called him stupid a, a thousand, two thousand, twelve thousand times, and he is he is monstrously stupid. Uh, but I never really believed the dementia stuff. But one time, one thing that was mentioned in the book was that he, they said he had trouble remembering his old friend's name at Mar-a-Lago. And I was like, that's the only anecdote I've ever heard. And that's kind of weak. That him not being able to find the limo, never believed in it, never covered it on the show. So, and people might get angry at that. But look, it turns out, yeah, yeah, he, he doesn't have dementia. He's just stupid. That's a totally different thing. But once you take that excuse away and that escape hatch away, and if Mueller catches him with something really significant, well, then this is actually not good news for the country because there goes the release valve. So that means Trump is more likely to get entrenched and fight. Oof, and that could be a mess. So I really wish he hadn't done this. I'm happy for him that he's got good health. Uh, but, you know, whether it's for progressives, or more importantly for Trump and his allies, they've just taken the Alzheimer's excuse off the table. Not sure that was a good idea. Okay. So, that could be a lot more relevant than than we realize. Alright, now, let's go beat up Democrats. So yesterday on the show, I got a little animated uh, about how the Democrats are botching uh, the DACA fight. So that's the DREAM Act. That's for the young kids who were brought into the country um, and didn't have a say on whether they were coming in or not. They've lived uh, almost their whole lives here in America. And, and even though they're undocumented, they have shown some degree of success. There's 800,000 of them, and this is the only country they've known. So um, the country is united on the 70% of Americans believe that they should be allowed to stay. That's the DREAM Act. Uh, and, um, and in fact, the majority of Trump voters believe they should be able to stay. And so one of the points I made on the show was, one, Democrats should fight harder. And what does that mean? Well, you should insist on a clean DREAM Act because you have the American people on your side. And if it means a government shutdown, the Republicans control uh, the entirety of the government, the House, the Senate, and the White House. So they would be blamed for the shutdown. This is a position of incredible strength. And if you don't use this strength as leverage, well, then you're never, ever going to fight back. And it turns out, even Republicans agree with me. So Joe Scarborough, who is a former Republican congressman and definitely right wing, yes, he, he's upset at Donald Trump, but uh, he is definitely right wing, has been his whole life. And, and you know, Morning Joe is, is pretty much the thoughts of the establishment in a lot of ways. Mike Barnacle's on there. I don't know what he claims his politics are, but these are, you know, very standard uh, conventional wisdom thinkers. And even they are going, wow. The Democrats are so weak. If they don't fight on this, what will they fight on? Now, I have a theory as to why they're not fighting, but I want to share it with you after the clip. First of all, look look at the state of affairs when former Republicans and the leaders of conventional wisdom, even they agree the Democrats are weak. Watch. I'm going to talk to Democrats here because we've been tough to, with Republicans. If you're a Democrat and you do anything to help this president who is sounding racist, and Republicans who've attacked Dick Durbin, questioned his integrity, questioned his honesty. If you're a Democrat and do anything to help the government, keep, uh, help, the, help Republicans keep the government open mm-hmm. without attaching a clean DACA bill to it, then you don't deserve to be in the majority this year, at the end of this year, because you're too weak. Democrats have to go after them. They were attacked. The president was racist uh, in his remarks. He's now attacked the Congressional Black Caucus and basically said they're jokes. They called Dick Durbin a liar. You make them pay for that. And while you're making them pay for that, you also do what's good for America and you get the dreamers. Uh, You get a deal for the dreamers. Or you don't give Republicans a single vote. They own Congress. If they can't keep the government open, the voters will blame Republicans, not Democrats. Well, Joe, if they they don't do that, they're clearly in the wrong business because they don't understand when they're playing from a position of sheer strength, which is what they are now, because they're playing up against the president. You just described it, and you just described the situation that the Democrats are in as opposed to the weakened Republicans because of the president. 
So look at all of that they're saying. First of all, they, they, there's Joe Scarborough, former Republican congressman, uh, clearly right wing, saying if Democrats won't fight for progressives, for progressive positions, then they're monumentally weak. And Mike Barnacle explains they're in a position of sheer strength, yet they are hesitant to use it. So what explains this? Uh, well, there's, there's two factors, uh, and they are similar. So one is that, well, two and a half. Let's tackle the half first. Uh, so part of where the Democrats get their money is unions. And so there's a lot of government workers, and government workers will, will vote Democrat. They also are in a lot of unions. So those guys go, no, don't shut the government down. Don't, 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 don't. Okay. Well, how about, you know, lever using it as leverage for progressive victories? Yeah, 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 yeah. But I work for the government, or I work for this union, so that's their problem, not my problem. Don't do it. So let's keep it real. That's one of the issues here. The next, but the next big issue is corporate donors overall. Because if you shut the government down, what happens? You want to know what happens? The markets go down. No. Nope. No donor, Republican or Democrat, wants that to happen. So they tell all their guys. Now, Trump, they can't control. But they tell the Democrats, hey, look, that guy's out of control. There's nothing you can do about it, so you better bow your head. Because I will not risk the markets. All of our money's in the markets. So that's the thing they never, ever talk about on television, almost never talk about it in print media either. Those corporate donors tell them, under no circumstance, do you ever threaten our precious, precious market where we have all of our money. So that's why you think they're weak. You're like, well, how in the world can you not see the, your position of strength? Because they don't actually have that position of strength. Because they are told by their bosses, hey, I don't care what you think you can get. I don't care if you have 70% popularity on this issue. I don't care if you think you could win elections in 2018. I don't care if you win the election. I care that the market doesn't go down. You will not shut the government down. And they tell all of them, and that is why the a huge reason why the Democrats do not fight. They're ordered not to fight. And then one last thing about the weakness. What, what do donors want? If they want lower taxes and they want deregulation, which all helps their bottom line. And they want lower wages for their workers, which also helps their bottom line. They want really strong Republicans who insist on deregulating and lower taxes, especially for corporations. They're kind of like what we have now. And they want a controlled opposition who is going to say, oh, golly, gee, don't do that. Oh, they got the tax cuts again. <laughs> well, I guess there's nothing we can do. Like, oh, don't do this, don't do that. Well, you, there is something you can do. You can shut the government down. Oh, no, 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 we're not going to do that, we're not going to do that. that. You could do this or that to block the efforts of the Republicans. They blocked your Supreme Court nominee for a year, and it seemed like they couldn't do that, but they did do that. What you need, if you are really wealthy, powerful corporate donors, is really weak Democrats. A controlled opposition that will constantly tell you there's nothing we can do. So there's 330 million people in the country. If you want to fund strong progressives, well, you can fund, find plenty of strong progressives to fund. If you want to find weak Democrats, there's plenty of weak Democrats to find. And so the magic trick is in the pre-selection. So they don't have to write Democratic leaders a memo telling them, hey, remember to be weak cowards and always give it to Republicans. Now do your job. They don't have to say that because they already funded the weak Democrats and propelled them and, and, and told everybody else, don't primary them. That wouldn't be unity. Don't primary them. We already pre-selected them to cower when the strong Republicans we also funded come in. And that's what they do. So that's why even Scarborough and Barnacle are like, gee, well, how could the Democrats be this weak? It's unbelievable. It's not unbelievable. They're paid to lose. They're paid to be that weak. That is what our institutionalized corruption and legalized bribery has led to. So don't be surprised the next time you see it, you will keep on seeing it until small donor-based, uncorrupted progressives actually defeat the corrupted corporate Democrats. If we don't defeat them, they will keep Oh, golly gee, accidentally losing the Republicans. Even ones as monstrous and unpopular as Donald Trump. They're losing to a guy who's sitting at a 32% popularity rating. How is that possible? The only way that it's possible is if that's not an accident. If that's not something they 
fail to defeat if it's part of the plan. And even them, they might not know that it's the plan. Again, it doesn't have to be in a smoke-filled room. It could be that they got selected because they are pathetically weak, and those donors had a sense they would never fight back so the Republicans can give corporations and the rich and powerful everything they ever wanted. Kind of like what's been happening for the last 40 years. Okay. Um, I got to take a break. <laughs> and when I when we come back, uh, we are going to get to the, the Department of Homeland Security Secretary. Uh, she doesn't know if Norway is white or not. Well, well, we'll look into it and tell you what's going on when we return. Hey, Dave. Uh, as you can probably see, this guy froze. Frozen crash. You know, I was watching, I'm watching a documentary on the Vietnam War. And there was a TV journalist in the middle of some tiny little village in Vietnam doing live TV as the soldiers were burning the Vietnamese huts. And it didn't crash. And that was 1965, and he was in Vietnam. Okay.
and it had to stand there, stand outside. So I had to stand outside. All right, back on the Young Turks. I'm going to read a couple tweets for you guys. Skepticus Rex says, as an artist, uh, if I was commissioned to create a grotesque slug alien, wearing human skin suit to hide among us, then is pretty much what I would draw. Uh, But you know what? I'm going to be fair and and disagree. Um, Because it'd be too obvious. Wouldn't you, like, if you're an alien hiding, wouldn't you want to take a non-alien look to you? Maybe you look good or something. Anyway, uh, I live in a glass house, so I'm going to move on. Uh, Rian Chambers says, uh, I guess TYT Live had another joke that wasn't going to land because they allowed Jake to tell another dad joke. Ladies and gentlemen, the joke has landed. Look, the whole flush thing doesn't even make any sense. Okay, so that one didn't even land. Uh, the loose band, and yeah, that, that, that one landed. Okay, that's my own assessment. Uh, bitchy Gay Guy says, wait, Trump's blood pressure is better than mine? I'm a 35-year-old granola eating ve- vegan. What the fuck? <laughs> well, that's, uh, that is genetics partly. It's partly what you do, what you eat, what, how much you exercise. In fact, my, my doctor always tells me what the fuck. He's like, I, you look like a mess. Uh, but, and, there's no reason in the world why you should be healthy, but apparently you are. Um, and finally, Carl says, I would not doubt that Bannon has already started talks for a book at this point. That's a great point by Carl, because I don't know if he's going to turn evidence against uh, Trump uh, with Mueller or the House Intelligence Committee, uh, but he's got no way to make money left, or more importantly, I think he still has the Seinfeld money uh, he has no, and Goldman Sachs money, uh, but he, he doesn't really have a way to make an impact anymore other than a book. So it would be shocking if he didn't uh, do one. Okay, so and that one ought to be a doozy. So let's go forward. I got some more super stories for you guys. Okay. The Secretary of Department of Homeland Security testified in front of Congress. And uh, boy, she has some interesting uh, and amusing excuses for Donald Trump's behavior. behavior. Her name is Kristen Nielsen. And uh, she was questioned by a lot of the senators, uh, many of whom were frustrated. Let's start with Dick Durbin, who was in the infamous meeting where uh, Donald Trump made the shithole comments. And, and Durbin is the one who actually uh, called him out on in the first place, where he, where the president called Haiti, uh, some Latin American countries, and all of the African countries shitholes. So here's the exchange uh, back and forth. What do you remember the president saying about immigration from African countries to the United States? What I heard him saying was that he'd like to move away from a country-based quota system to a merit-based system. So it shouldn't matter where you're from. It should matter what you can contribute to the United States. How did he characterize those countries in Africa? Overwhelming. In, I, I don't, I don't specifically know. remember a category, categorization of countries in Africa. I think what he was saying is... Uh, as far as best I could tell, and as you know, there were about a dozen people in the room, there were a lot of cross-conversations, there was a lot of rough talk by a lot of people in the room, uh, but what I understood him to be saying is, let's move away from the countries, and let's look at the individual, and make sure that those we bring here can contribute to our society. What I understood him to be saying, not what he said, what I understood him to be saying is, let's look away from the countries and look at the individuals, but he didn't actually say that at all. In fact, he said the opposite. He said, why are we letting these countries in, which he described as shithole countries, and he said about the Haitians, take them out. He said, why don't we let uh, people from Norway? And yet we that's have not person-based, and that's not merit-based, as she said. That's country-based. I like Norwegians. I don't like these other countries. Let's let those guys in. Fairly clear. She said, I don't specifically remember what he said when he was talking his rough talk. Now you know the excuse they're using, right? Well, the president didn't necessarily say shithole, so that's why it's fake news. He might have just said shit house. Oh my god, why didn't you say that from the beginning? Well, that sounds lovely. All right, more of this nonsense. 
Do you remember the president saying expressly, I want more Europeans. Why can't we have more immigrants from Norway? Uh, I do remember what he I do remember him asking about the concept of underrepresented countries as a uh, fix. This was in the con this was in the conversation about removing the diversity lottery and how we could reallocate that. And I do remember him asking uh, if we do that and we then assign those to countries that are unrepresented, aren't we just continuing non merit based immigration? So the last part is what gets under my skin. So underrepresented countries. Well, look, part of the reason that, uh, and Norway uh, does have far greater wealth than, for example, Haiti. That's of course true, right? But part of the reason we don't have as much immigrants coming in from Norway is because they have much greater wealth. They're doing fine in Norway. In fact, they've got universal health care. They've got a much more progressive government. They're generally way happier than, than here. That's based on actual studies. And Northern European countries are generally uh, pretty happy. They're also overall astoundingly liberal so they don't want to come here to this draconian system where we have you know uh, free market run amok with no regulations etc and the great wealth disparity that's part of the reason why we're not as happy as northern europe but so it's when the irish came over to america they didn't come over because they're like hey you know what um everything's going great in ireland we're all really really rich you guys want to leave our mansions and go over to america no, they had the Great Potato Famine. They were dying, and they had to go look for a new hope. That's what we were, America, and that's what we have been for immigrants. And if we had stopped them and said, oh, okay, we want a merit-based system. We only want what, what merit based on what? The Irish that came in were amazing for America. The Italians that came in that were dirt poor were amazing for America. The Jews and, 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 and blacks and Latinos and all these different races that have come in have been terrific for America and have built America. A lot of them with their bare hands. And they didn't come because they were already rich. What other merit will you use? Or are you going to make them take the SATs? What are we doing here? Take an IQ test? We've never done that. Well, give us your huddled masses. They're coming for a dream and they're hungry. That's why they made America great. Because they were hungry to do better. In the case of the Irish, literally, there was a famine going on. So this whole idea of, oh, let's do a merit-based system, it just means let's let rich white people in. It's gross. That's not what America is. We want people who, have, who are driven to find a better life and to live the American dream. Okay, so one more from her. You said on Fox News that the president used strong language. What was that strong language? Uh, let's see. Strong language, there was... Uh I, apologies, I don't remember specific word. Uh, what I was struck with, frankly, as I'm sure you were as well, was just the general uh, profanity that was used in the room by almost everyone. Uh, did and, you hear me use profanity? No, sir, neither did, did I. Did you hear Senator Graham use profanity? Uh, I, I did hear tough language from Senator Graham, yes, sir. What did he say? Uh, he used tough language. He was impassioned. I think he was feeling very strongly about the issue, as was everyone in the room. Uh, and to underscore a point, uh, I think he was using some, some strong language. Do you recall that the strong language he used repeated exactly what the president had said prior to that? Uh, I remember uh, specific cuss words being used by a variety of members. Just say it! Just say it! We all know what he said. What does rough talk mean? Right? So, again, what's the difference between shithole and shithouse? It doesn't matter. Rough talk isn't like... Boy, I am vexed. <laughs> it's not, uh, I, I rough talk him and run him off. <laughs> Old school TYT reference. Yee, yee. Okay, so, no, it's, that means curse words. Curse words like shithole. Just say, I thought that conservatives were real tough guys. They're like, oh, we're going to call it like it is. We like Donald Trump because he tells it like it is. He just says it, right? All of a sudden, I guess he's scared. I guess that's your big, bold leader and all of his allies. They're scared. Was, they admit that it was rough talk. So you know that he was cursing. You know he was denigrating them. You know he was putting them down. So I guess they're just too scared to say the actual words. What happened? I thought you guys were tough guys. No. He wants credit from his base, but he doesn't want to alienate everybody else. Oh, that sounds like a standard politician. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, but I'm not done with Nielsen yet. Because I am greatly amused by her and others. Okay, so here we go. So, uh, Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, Kristen Nielsen, is testifying in front of the Senate. Um, Pat Leahy, Senator Leahy from Vermont, is going to ask her uh, 
Very, very normal standard question. She's going to give an amusing answer. Let's watch. Norway is a predominantly white country, isn't it? I'm, I, I actually do not know that, sir, but I imagine that is the case. <laughs> I got news for you. Yeah, man. Yeah. Okay, here, in fact, I'll show you the numbers. We look bother to look them up. Um, in Norway is 83.2% Norwegian, otherwise known as white, uh, 8.3% other European, which is otherwise known as largely white, and 8.5% other. So that's about 91% white. Um, and by the way, the other might also have plenty of white countries as well. Uh, but of course, Norway's white, of course. What do you think Norway is? Like, but they can't help themselves. They're greasy politicians. They have to lie and bend the truth and say, okay, I don't know that Norway's white. I haven't looked into it. By the way, you're working in Homeland Security. Maybe you should look into it. Is that's kind of your job. Aren't we doing extreme betting? Or do we not do extreme betting of white countries? So that's why you never looked into it. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> now we're going to go to uh, Republican Senator Joni, uh, Jody Ernst. Okay. So she's in Iowa. By the way, it's not like the room is full of minorities, as you'll see. Okay. She makes another excuse about Norway, and look at the reaction. First telling the crowd, other world leaders support Trump. He is standing up for a lot of the countries that where we have seen. Um, name some, a few. Could you name a few? Yeah, you got Norway. Um, Norway. And Norway. And Norway. How many of you think, you know, you laugh at folks? Who borders Norway? Russia. <laughs> and? I don't know what that means. That's a group of good uh, old American white folks from Iowa laughing their ass off at their Senator Joni Ernst. And she's like, I mean, he's got, somebody had to stick up for Norway. Somebody had to do it. Poor Norway. They're always getting abused. Norway's doing perfectly fine. They didn't need Trump to stand up before them. And by the way, they are far, far more progressive than we are and are probably annoyed that Trump uh, is claiming them as the, as uh, among his folk. Because they're not his folk politically at all. The only reason why he mentioned Norway is because, and I'll apparently have to fill in the secretary here, Secretary Nielsen, because they are largely white. That is true. Okay. All right. Uh, fun for everybody. Now, next door. Um, Jim Acosta is at CNN, and we know we've got this whole controversy about Donald Trump calling Haiti and African countries uh, shitholes, and then uh, saying we need to have more people in from Norway. Um, now, it's a fair question as to why he might have picked out Norway as his example of the good countries, especially given that the president largely doesn't agree with Norwegian politics, which are far more liberal. Uh, so Acosta wanted to uh, address that question uh, at the White House. And for his efforts, he was shown the door. Let's watch. Mr. President, did you say that you want more people to come in from Norway? Did you say that you wanted more people to come in from Norway? Is that true, Mr. President? I want them to come in from everywhere. Everywhere. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. Just Caucasian or white countries, sir? Or do you want people to come in from other parts of the world where there are people of color? Jim, thank you. And uh, not sure if you can hear the end of that there, uh, Wolf, uh, but as I tried to ask whether he wanted uh, more people to come in just from white or Caucasian countries, uh, he said out. He pointed at me and said out as in get out of the Oval Office. Uh, I don't know if you saw it. You could rewind. Um, <laughs> Acosta, yeah, Trump goes out. And Acosta goes, <laughs> I didn't see that coming. <laughs> Getting kicked out of the White House for asking a question. And just for a second, we're going to go on with how Acosta got kicked out. This is not how a democracy that believes in the First Amendment and freedom of the press is supposed to act. But uh, also on the substance of the question, uh, I, I want people from everywhere except Haiti all of Africa, El Salvador, and I can go on and on. The countries that you called shitholes, you said, about Haiti, you said, let's get them out. About Nigeria, in an earlier conversation, not even this one, he had said, why would we let them in? If they come here, they'll stay. They won't want to go back to their huts in Africa. I am not convinced that you want people from everywhere. And by the way, if you do, I got good news for you. You're the president. You can make that happen tomorrow. Strike a deal with the Democrats. Have a new policy. Oh, right. You don't want people from everywhere. You just want them from countries like Norway. Gee, I wonder why. Okay, so Acosta's going to give you more details here. Thank you very much, everybody. You, just Caucasian or white countries, sir, or do you want people to come in from other parts of the world where there are people of color? Jim, thank you. Okay, so before we get to Acosta's details, I like that because J.R. Jackson, our producer, always does like a Zapruder film-like 
analysis of what happened. Oh. <laughs> so that one was clear. Now let's go to Acosta's explanation. Uh, after that, we went into the Roosevelt Room uh, inside the White House where he and the President of Kazakhstan uh, made some pretty lengthy remarks. And then at the conclusion of those remarks, uh, we attempted to ask the President more questions about this controversy. And it was at that point, Wolf, I have to underline, I've never encountered anything like this before at the White House. Uh, the Deputy Press Secretary, Hogan Gidley, uh, and a wrangler, a press wrangler over here at the White House uh, got uh, basically right up in my face and in the faces of other poor reporters here at the White House and started shouting so loudly uh, that it was impossible for the president to hear our questions or even uh, see that we were trying to ask questions. It was that kind of a display. Uh, it reminded me of something that you, you might see in uh, less democratic countries uh, when people at the White House or officials of a foreign government uh, attempt to get in the way of the press and, and doing their jobs. But essentially, that is what just happened a few moments ago here. They, they were so determined to block us uh, from asking questions that they got right up in our face and started shouting, no questions, no questions, uh, so the president could make an exit from the Roosevelt Room without taking any questions. Wolf. It's a really serious issue, but I do have to make a couple of goofy comments. Has Wolf Blitzer ever had a facial expression? It is amazing how stoic he remains in every interview ever uh, for the last 20, 30 years. Okay, now on to the substance. Um, the president doesn't really believe in the Constitution. Uh, freedom of the press, he thinks, is an annoyance and one he'd like to get rid of, and he said it a billion different times. He's about to do some stupid fake news awards. He is openly hostile to the press. Look, you want to fight back against press that you think is biased? That's totally fair. Trying to shut down the press, threatening their broadcast license, as he did with NBC, uh, threatening mergers, uh, as he's doing with Time Warner and AT&T. Now, you might have different issues with that merger, and I do. But him saying on the record that he's going to look into it because he doesn't agree with CNN, those are massive, actual First Amendment issues. Now, not letting reporters ask questions. That's not what America stands for. All right. But uh, I can't help it. Um, you know Trump. He was probably like, oh, President of Kazakhstan. That's great. I can't wait to meet for it. He's <laughs> probably profoundly disappointed. That's why he wanted to wrap it up as soon as possible. All right. Anyways, uh, I'm a bad man. Uh, we're uh, going to take a quick break here. Remember how I promised you uh, good news for progressives? That's coming up next. Congratulations to you, the Young Turk, and other digital media for breaking through barriers in providing information to people that we don't see on corporate. A really great idea that you had, and you noticed that uh, mainstream press had no interest in covering uh, this policy. They didn't want to talk about Medicare for all for whatever reason. Well, we know what the reason. <laughs> You don't talk about every reason. You turn on television today, what are you going to see? The pharmaceutical industry? One of these crazy ads. I, I'd be nervous about taking <laughs> these drugs with all of the side effects. Right. But that's another story. Right. But they are dependent on, on uh, advertising uh, from the pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> You're right. And, um, you know, just as our politicians are bought, mainstream media is experiencing the same type of corruption. So uh, there is a way to get around that, uh, and that is independent media. Really, for the first time, I guess, we are going to have a town meeting devoted toward a better understanding of what can get more. Let's so answer some of the very good questions that you raise. We're going to get from physicians, we're going to get from economists. We'll hear from people who may be critical of the idea and listen to their concern. But we will spend a significant amount of time talking about why the United States is the only major country on earth not to guarantee health care to all what we spend twice as much for capital for a dysfunction of the system. That's one thing. But here is the second thing that excites me very much. Is I have believed for a very, very long time that not that corporate media is fake news, that's not what it's, it's about, it's not that they lie about this or that, but there are major areas where, for a variety of reasons, mostly economic, they choose not to focus. Right? They're not going to focus too much about income and wealth and equality, just the people who own their networks are in the 1%. And they're not going to focus on an issue like Medicare for all because of their dependency on pharmaceutical industries. Uh, advertising insurance company advertising. This could be the very first step in bringing millions of people 
into serious discussion about the serious issues facing our country with the time that we need to really go into depth. I want to thank the young folks. Uh, Chelsea Charles writes in, by the way, use hashtag TYT live on the show uh, while the show is live uh, to talk to us. Uh, we're going to do Aziz Ansari uh, controversy in the next segment. I imagine there'll be a lot of tweets about that. Hashtag TYT live. And by the way, whenever you're watching the show, sharing is caring. So uh, share on Facebook, YouTube, or wherever else you're viewing. Chelsea Charles writes in on Twitter. She tried so hard, uh, referring to Nielsen, uh, to not... Uh, make him look like a racist idiot. No one would ever believe he said that. I mean, you're right. She made it sound so much more sophisticated. The, the president is trying to move away from a country-based system to a merit-based system. He didn't say any of that. He said, I like people from Norway, not from Haiti. Uh, Don Migueletto writes him, For years I've been saying the discourse in D.C. has sunk to the level of professional wrestling. Turns out it's more than discourse. Democrats are now jabronis. Hate to lose. That is a great way of putting it. I never thought about it that way. Uh, not in the paid to lose, but the uh, jabroni analogy. So uh, maybe I'll start calling them jabronis from now on. Nice job. Okay. By the way, just a quick shout out to one of our um, sponsors, Aspiration.com. They're the non-bank bank. bank. Uh, so if you put your money in there, number one, you're going to get 1% interest rate. Good luck. Go, go look around. Go look around everywhere to see if you can find a bank with a 1% interest rate. You won't be able to. They have that, and they don't allow for any of their investment funds to go to fossil fuel, firearms, private prisons, um, and they don't invest in oil. So they're a clean, progressive institution, and they give away 10% of their revenue to charity, which is unreal. So you, you do right got your money in a clean place, and you're actually making the most amount of money from there. Uh, so I, I love progressive companies like that. That's why they're one of our sponsors. All right, let's go over here and talk about net neutrality. I got good news for you, okay? Now, in net neutrality, we had very bad news recently. Ajit Pai, the uh, head of the FCC, uh, led a charge to get rid of net neutrality, which means that uh, now uh, we don't have freedom on the Internet, and uh, the 
internet ser- service providers like Verizon, AT&T, and Comcast can control uh, how fast or slow uh, the different websites are, how much they can charge uh, different people. Uh, they're not uh, mandated to be to treat everyone equally or to treat each website equally. So the only thing that they have as their guide is um, to maximize their own profit. So they can do that any way they like. So that could obviously lead to a disastrous dismantling of the Internet for their benefit, not for our benefit. So some folks uh, in Congress have decided to fight back. Some good news on that front. But the Hill reports Senate Democrats have put together 50 votes for a measure meant to block the Federal Communications Commission's December decision to end net neutrality rules put in place by the Obama administration. Of course, um, they don't have the tiebreaker in the Senate. The Republicans do, so they're going to need one more vote. They explain here, Democrats are just one GOP vote shy of the 51-vote threshold for a Senate resolution of disapproval, which would strike down the FCC's December rule changes. So, super important. Uh, Now, don't get too excited. There's a huge caveat there in a second. But Ed Markey, a uh, senator from Massachusetts, is leading the charge here. He's been fantastic on this issue. I beat up on the Democrats all the time, rightfully so. But credit where credit is due is Senator Markey is doing a wonderful job in fighting for freedom on the Internet. And it doesn't matter if you're a conservative or a liberal. Uh, probably right-wing sites would be the first targeted if there were uh, any issues of corporations wanting to clean things up and make the Internet more safe. Right. So uh, Markey fighting for all Americans there. And he has gotten some Republicans to join, including Susan Collins. But he does need one more colleague to come to that side to win in the Senate. Um, But the measure, if it passes the Senate, faces a murky future as it would have to pass the GOP held House and get President Trump's signature to go into effect. So there's still plenty of hurdles. And obviously the biggest one being Donald Trump. But look, this is how you build momentum. If it winds up passing the Senate, at least they're moving it. Then you go to the House, and you might be surprised that there might be some by some degree of bipartisan agreement there as well. Whether it's enough to win in the House is a different question. But even if you don't win in the House, you set it up for a vote after the 2018 elections. You use it as an election issue, you route the Republicans, and then you bring in new congressmen who will vote in the opposite direction. And if you build up enough momentum, yes, you can even override the veto of the president. So at a minimum, they're at least on the road. Now, look, a lot of this has to be done within 60 days to get rid of a regulation. Is it going to get done in 60 days where you win in the Senate? Yes, you can win in the Senate in 60 days. You just need one more brave Republican or one funded by the Internet companies. Let's keep it real. The reason we have a fighting chance here is because we also have giant companies on our side. So they have Verizon, Comcast, AT&T, etc., and the good guys have Facebook, Google, Netflix, who, who don't want to take away net neutrality. Look, I don't care why they're on the right side. Uh, I just care that they are. And and so, the, and by the way, to be fair and open and honest, the Young Turks have business dealings with almost all of those companies. So, on both sides. But uh, in this case, the internet companies want to keep freedom uh, on the internet. And, uh, and almost the entirety of the internet agrees uh, there's a couple of uh, people pretending uh, to be in favor of protecting the Internet, but want to hand it over to those private corporations. But they haven't really convinced the right wing either. Good luck, Ted Cruz. Keep trying. By the way, Ted, uh, if there's no freedom on the Internet, you might not be able to watch the accidental porn you tweeted out the other day. I'm just saying. So finally, I want to go to uh, Ed Markey for one last quote on this. He says, Republicans now have a clear choice. Be on the right side of history and stand with the American people who support a free and open Internet or hold hands with the special interests who want to control the Internet for their own profit. Well, that's nearly a perfect description of what's going on here. And I don't have to spend too much time convincing you guys because, like I said, right wing, left wing, in the middle, almost the entire Internet agrees. Yes, we would like to have freedom uh, on the Internet. Uh, The only people who don't agree are the corrupt politicians who have taken money from the internet service providers and with those legalized bribes they've decided no we'd rather give the internet away to them so they can make more money and give us more legalized bribes perhaps we shouldn't base our elections on private financing they might wind up working for private interests think about it wolf-pack.com get money out of politics let's go back to democracy and actually have real debates over the issues and not have the corruption we have now. 
Okay. So now, uh, one last story for you guys in this hour. Um, then we go to, uh, sorry, like I said, God help us. All right. More good news. So believe it or not, there's some good news coming out of uh, the redistricting issues at, at the state level. So now, you know, part of the problem in democracy is the insane gerrymandering. Uh, that's where they draw these maps that wind up all around the state and go, okay, now I've sliced and diced the state in a way that is maniacal, that doesn't match the geography at all, but uh, helps me uh, keep the state in either one political party or the other. By the way, both parties do this. The Republicans happen to do it more, but I'll give you some context on that in a second, too. First of all, last week we heard from North Carolina. In case you didn't hear about that, I want you to know about it because it's super important. Then I'll tell you about what happened in Pennsylvania today. Judge James A. Wynn Jr. Uh, said that Republicans in North Carolina's legislature had been motivated by invidious partisan intent as they car carried out their obligation in 2016 to divide the state into 13 congressional districts, 10 of which are held by Republicans. The result, Judge Wynn wrote, violated the 14th Amendment's guarantee of equal protection. Um, of course, when he wrote uh, that they were motivated by invidious partisan intent, Donald Trump said, what? Okay, so let's break this down. North Carolina at this point is a purple state. They voted for Trump in the last election, but they voted for a Democratic governor. And last election before that, they voted for Barack Obama. So they're close to 50-50. They could go either way. But the way the Republicans drew up the, drew up the map, they get 10 out of the 13 seats. It's outrageous. It's obviously not representative of the people of North Carolina. They want democracy. You should want democracy that is representative of you. Instead, they stole your representatives, and they did it based on partisan advantage. Now, if you're a Republican going, oh, yeah, that's awesome, man. I love when we cheat. Who cares about democracy? Be careful what you wish for. You have the same problem in Maryland, except the Democrats have taken advantage. And they are getting a disproportionate number of seats uh, based on the voting patterns of Maryland. Now, on either side, you shouldn't want it. You should want the voters to actually get real representatives. Well, one more quote from Judge Wynn in, in that regard. He said, a wealth of evidence proves the General Assembly's intent to subordinate the interests of the non-Republican voters and entrench Republican domination of the state's congressional delegation. So, look, that's really important, because you remember uh, Bush v. Gore, that was in the year 2000, and the Supreme Court said, no, look, the 14th Amendment's really important, and we have to make sure that every vote is equal. It's a nationwide election, so I don't want Florida setting different rules than the other states, so I don't care about their recount. I'm going to end their recount. I don't even want them to recount the vote. By the way, when the press organizations recount the vote in Florida, it turns out Al Gore had not just won the popular vote. He had won the Electoral College. He had won the state of Florida. So that's why the Republicans in the Supreme Court blocked that. And it, it began the... the I don't know that it began it, but it certainly cemented the corruption of the Supreme Court. But they claim they cared so much about the 14th Amendment and make sure that everything is equal. Well, then you would certainly care about the 14th Amendment in this context to make sure that one vote, uh, it, it, one man one vote principle of America is, uh, is protected, right? And by the way, now the Supreme Court is looking at this at a federal level as well. Now let's go to Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania Supreme Court will hear oral argument on Wednesday in a case uh, alleging the state's 2011 congressional map drawn by Republicans violates protections on freedom of expression and equal protection in the state's constitution. Similar idea. Um, I wait till you get a load of their uh, map in a second, but uh, also good point here. They're like, look, this we're not just guided by the U.S. Constitution in Pennsylvania. We're also guided by the Pennsylvania Constitution, which actually it has enshrined democracy even more uh, protections and, and in a better way, and saying that, hey, you're violating Pennsylvania's constitution here uh, with the outrageous uh, gerrymandered map that you have. So, to give you a sense of that, since 2012, Republicans have consistently been able to win 13 of the state's 18 congressional seats, despite winning only 50% of the statewide vote. Yeah, man, that is outrageous. They have 50% of the vote, and in a democracy, they should have 50% of the seats. They're like, nope. We cheated. We drew the map in a way that even though we get 50% of the vote, we're going to get 13 out of the 18 seats. That's not democracy. That's not America. Yes, this is when the uh, courts are supposed to step in and say that is not constitutional. That is not one man, one vote. 
Uh, now, uh, Michael Lee, an expert here, explains. Uh, when in Pennsylvania would uh, suggest that advocates may have been overlooking the state constitutions, many of which, like Pennsylvania's, have more expansive and robust rights and protections than federal constitution. A win in Pennsylvania could open the door to more state court litigation. Now, again, this is a bipartisan issue. Uh, this term, the Supreme Court will also hear a First Amendment challenge to Maryland's congressional map, which benefits Democrats. And I'm not in favor of Maryland's map either. I want democracy. Call me crazy. And finally, uh, one more uh, here from Sam Levine at HuffPost. Drawing the electoral map, he explains, um, uh, they say is always going to be intertwined with politics, and courts have never intervened to set a standard for how much politics can factor into redrawing district lines. And I want you to have that context. Yes, uh, in the past, the courts have been very reluctant to get involved in drawing of the political maps, uh, because they say that is a political question. And yes, according to our system, they're supposed to leave that to the representatives. But now, the representatives are no longer representative. So that is when the courts are supposed to protect the Constitution and our system of government and step in and say that's unconstitutional. You need to find a system that is not this unfair, uh, that robs all of these people in Maryland, Pennsylvania, Michigan, North Carolina, of their right uh, to their vote and to equal representation. So at least we're on that road. I hope we arrive at that conclusion for all of our sakes. All right, I got to take a quick break here. When we come back, Aziz Ansari uh, charged with, um, well, I'm not quite sure what he's charged with, uh, but certainly doing uh, the wrong thing in a sexual relationship by an anonymous source. Um, is he right? Is she right? Well, we're going to have a tough conversation about that when we return.
Minuto, né? Experience with you guys. Stephen writes in, well, Trump doesn't read the things he signs, so there's a chance he could let it pass uh, about the net neutrality legislation. Uh. Um, uh, I am Sox says, I'd wager Trump and Comcast have around the same approval rating. <laughs> it's a good chance. And Jeremy Kohler says, this version of the Republican Party has never been on the right side of history. Net neutrality will likely be the same. Hopefully I'm wrong. Um, well, I share your skepticism about the Republican Party, uh, but I also hope you're wrong. Uh, we'll see if they do the right thing. Don't hold your breath, but let's keep fighting for it. Uh, members of the day are Michael Vandalos and Claudia Noguera. There's no way I said that right. So, uh, Michael and Claudia, thank you so much. We appreciate you being members, supporting independent media, and letting us do what we do. That's tytnetwork.com slash join, and you get the whole two-hour show downloaded or podcasted without the ads anytime you like. Um, so, uh, I've been uh, promising the uh, sorry story, but I see we actually have a third in the rundown here. We have a third. Um, okay, I'm not trying to reach a matter. You we're guys. definitely <laughs> going to. We're definitely going to get to that story. I promise you, uh, especially because that's the story that I did. Uh, I read like an insane amount of perspectives on it just to make sure that I was fully informed before I gave my perspective. So, all right, great. Uh, all right, let's get going though. All right. A 39-year-old man by the name of Jorge Garcia has been deported back to Mexico. Now, what makes this story a little fascinating, extremely fascinating, is the fact that Jorge Garcia has no criminal record. He has been living in the United States for more than 30 years, and he was actually brought to the United States when he was only 10 years old. His uh, aunt actually brought him to the U.S., and he had an undocumented status, which he tried to get fixed back in 2005, but unfortunately uh, the lawyer that he was working with uh, filed the wrong documents and actually got him into more trouble than, you know, helping his situation. Why don't we deport that guy? So this is a devastating story because not only was Jorge Garcia a productive member of society, he worked as a landscaper and had no criminal record, he was also married to a U.S. citizen and had two children here in the United States, uh, two teenagers ages 15 and 12. Now, the story that we're about to uh, show you, the video we're about to show you, gives you a sense of how emotional this is, but it also shows you the ramifications of a broken immigration system and promises that went unkept by Trump, who claimed that he would not target people like Garcia. Take a look. <laughs> this is a goodbye that just doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense. This is a father saying goodbye to his wife and two teenage children. His name is Jorge Garcia. He was brought to the United States by his parents when he was 10 years old. Today, after living and working here for 30 years, Jorge Garcia was deported to Mexico. His wife, Cindy, says he has no criminal record, he has paid his taxes, and that he is a good man. He is a good man. Uh, again, has not broken any laws. Uh, the only thing that was working against him was the fact that he was brought here when he was 10 years old by his aunt, actually. And his parents were already here in the United States. Can I just say a couple things? First, a uh, great video uh, that CNN got there. We'll have the full link to that in the description box below if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, and, um, and I want to make sure you guys saw that because that, this is what we voted for. I want you to see it with your own eyes. Uh, and we're breaking up families. And look, I, I've heard from people there now hiding people in basements to make sure that ICE doesn't get them. So that's where we are today in America. And I can give you my own personal context on this. He was 10 when he was brought over. I was 8 when I came over as a legal immigrant. Okay? Now, so um, we're, I've been in this country now for almost 40 years. And this is where I grew up. This is my culture. Uh, I, if you brought me back to Turkey and put me there, I don't know what I would do. Uh, so I'm barely fluent in Turkish, but I 
don't know what job I would have. I'm pretty sure I couldn't be a Turkish dog show host, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, what do you do? What do you do? The guys, and, and so when you grow up here, this is your country. This is your culture. I grew up on the Pittsburgh Steelers and, and subs and pepperoni pizza and so did he, right? And all the other things that come along with it. He, he grew up on Seinfeld, not telenovelas, right? So you're taking somebody and saying, I don't care where you grew up. I don't care what kind of family you have, what your roots are. How much you think you're American, you're never going to be like us. And and by doing this, of course, you punish Garcia, who, again, did nothing wrong, right? Yeah, he, he was brought here when he was 10 years old and, as a result, had this undocumented status. But you're also punishing his kids, his wife. I mean, he is providing for his family. He's working as a landscaper. He's not doing anything wrong. His family's not doing anything wrong. They're law-abiding citizens who went to authorities and, and tried to get this all sorted out back in 2005. And unfortunately, you know, luck of the draw, they ended up with a terrible attorney who filed the wrong paperwork. But he was checking in with ICE on a yearly basis. He was following their rules. He was complying with whatever it is that they needed to see from him. And at the end, all it took was the election of one guy who has weaponized the issue of immigration to destroy this family's life like this. And he's going to go to Mexico to do what? He's been in the United States since he's been 10. He's 39 years old. What is he going to do in Mexico? So, And they don't care about that. But look, I, I don't want to let Republican voters off the hook um, and other conservative pundits. Remember when... Just a couple of days ago when Trump said that he was likely to do a clean deal for the Dreamers. Now, in his case, uh, Garcia is not a Dreamer. He missed that by two years, too. Okay? And so, uh, but when he said he was going to do allow those Dreamers to stay, which 70% of the country agrees with, and Coulter, Tucker Carlson, Fox News hosts, etc., were in a rage. They want to deport Jorge Garcia. They want to get rid of him. They don't. And they think, that, that's not my family, I don't care, I have no empathy for that guy. Get him out, get him out, get him out. And it's it's not an accident. So if you're a Trump voter, this is what you wanted. So congratulations. And I am guarantee you there's a lot of people that are watching this right now who will write it in the comment section like, yes, this was a total victory for them. They ripped apart a Latino family, they've got to be ecstatic about it. I know, but dare I say, those are the most miserable people on the planet, because Deporting people like Jorge Garcia is not going to make your situation better. I get it. There's a lot of pain and suffering out there. There's a lot of financial, you know, hurt out there. There are economic issues out there. I totally understand that those are legitimate concerns. But deporting Jorge Garcia is not going to get you paid better. Deporting Jorge Garcia is not going to create awesome quality jobs. It's not going to make sure that your family is better off. We are focusing on the wrong things. And keep in mind that it's your taxpayer money that is being used as a resource to deport law-abiding individuals like Jorge Garcia. And by, just own it, man. So, look, if you're offended by what I said, that doesn't make any sense. Trump said he was going to do this, so I'm, I guess I'm giving him credit in that sense. And now he's doing it. He said, I'm going to viciously break up our families, and you, were, you ecstatically voted for him. So if you don't like that, and now you find out, oh, well, that, that doesn't sound humane, that doesn't sound right, well, then don't vote for him or any other Republican that promises to do that. And if you do, you own it. You did that. It's depressing. But we're going to see more and more of these stories, you know, as the Trump administration moves forward. And, you know, every day there's something new. ICE officials showing up at 7-Elevens throughout the country. ICE officials just recently went to downtown Los Angeles at Grand Central Station uh, to just start harassing anyone who looks like they might not be uh, documented citizens of the United States. And if, if that's where you want to see your taxpayer money at play, well, congratulations. That's what you got. All right, uh, moving on to some possible good news. Recently, Attorney General Jeff Sessions made it abundantly clear that he didn't care if states had legalized marijuana for recreational use or medicinal use. He wants to utilize the Justice Department to go after states that have legalized marijuana, and uh, he will do so because he feels that federal law trumps state law, and it doesn't matter how voters in your state feel about it. Now, uh, the House of Representatives has sprung into action on this issue. Luckily, they're springing into action on something. And what they're planning on doing is uh, approaching this issue from two possible ways. One possible way is to uh, 
essentially pass legislation that would protect these states that have legalized marijuana for medicinal or recreational use. Another possibility is attaching this to the spending bill. If they uh, make it clear that the Attorney General or the Justice Department cannot go or use uh, taxpayer money to go after these states, well then it will protect these states temporarily. But I would argue that it's more important to have a standalone bill uh, that passes in Congress. So, uh, look, uh, they're actually taking some action. Look, they're actually taking some action, so uh, I'm uh, definitely in favor of that. Uh, and it doesn't mean it's going to pass. It's just 69 uh, House members right now. Obviously, there's 435 people in the House, and so they got a lot of work ahead of them. It's encouraging that it's bipartisan, and part of the reason for that is because now in the states that have legalized, people slash corporations have started to make money off of marijuana. And if you got companies making money, guess what you're going to have? Republican politicians on your side. So in the states that have legalized, Republicans are like, uh, what's going on? Are you giving me a campaign contribution because we legalized? I meant legalized the whole time. Did, what, did I say not legalized? I meant legalized. Yeah. So now those guys have flipped, and now we have a stronger and stronger coalition. Yeah, those guys flipped, and um, I completely agree with you that now they're addicted to the money, right? It, you know, they're addicted to the campaign donations, no doubt, but also that tax revenue that's coming into the states is wonderful, right? And so it's a great way to regulate and tax a drug that people like to use, and they were using regardless of the prohibition of marijuana. Another thing that I'm curious about, and this is pure speculation, this is a little bit of a goofy point, but hear me out. Um, I think a huge number of our Congress members have used marijuana. And they probably know that this is a ridiculous thing to, you know, prosecute people for or to use our resources on. You know what I'm saying? I, I do, but I actually don't agree. Yeah. Uh, and I'll tell you why. That, because I think that the uh, those are honorable gentlemen, and they would never do something as insidious as marijuana. You know they love that reaper. Come on. <laughs> okay. So, no, they're rolling deep. I got it. Uh, <laughs> he heard that phrase for the first time today during our production meeting, and now he's using it like he's a cool guy. Roll no, no. Get out of here. <laughs> okay. uh, no, I, I do cool talk. Anyway, um, no, of course they a lot of them have smoked uh, marijuana. Look at all of our presidents, Obama, Bush, Clinton. They all smoked, right? Um, but to them, no, they remember, most of these folks have no empathy at all. So... They've been against marijuana legalization the whole time when they were smoking weed when they were in college, and God knows how much longer after that. And and even, look, even Obama. Obama's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I smoked pot, and I did this, what the thing where hot boxing in the car or whatever, he did all that stuff. And then, hey, can you take it off of a Schedule One drug which compares it to the most lethal drugs uh, there is in the world? Nope, not going to do that. Just as usual with Obama, play around the edges just a little bit. I'm going to give you 5% change. But you did drugs. You did marijuana. Mm -hmm. Don't care. Bush, you did marijuana. Don't care. Okay? None of them cared. So it's not their personal experience. They have no empathy. It's it's the money, Lebowski. Just like you said, you nailed it. It's like the money while they're being gateway drugs to legalization. Absolutely. And so, and look, if that's what it takes, God bless. Because it is less dangerous than alcohol. It's insane that it's uh, illegal. So I hope that 69 becomes over 250. I hope they get enough senators. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Legalize it everywhere. And every state where you legalize, by the way, if it's about that you're in your state, Make sure you get out there and vote. If there are people who are running for Congress who say they're going to legalize, make sure you get out there and vote. Because there's going to be a tipping point. If enough politicians start taking money and getting the tax money as well, they're going to vote to legalize, and this thing's going to be over. So right now, we're in a dark place. We have Jeff Sessions as our Attorney General, who once said that he used to like the Klan until he found out that they smoked marijuana. So forget his views on the Klan. I assume he was joking. But that's how much he despises marijuana, all right? So, but we will get rid of these guys at some point, and you can even override them. You can. That's how our system of government works. But you got to vote for people who are on the right side of this issue, and it's an important issue. And it involves criminal justice reform. So don't don't take it lightly. Go vote based on this. So I would just like to toss to Jr. Who'd like to make a point, and it is. Seriously, a coincidence that he's wearing the shirt that he's wearing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
outside of just politicians that you were in current use, their children. I mean, I'm not trying to throw it by the end of the bus, so, but when Obama's kid was seen on camera at these events, they were like, that's kind of a violation of her privacy. She's not a, she didn't run for office. Now, politicians, kids, and family members start getting wrangled up and, and rounded up and put in the paddy wagons. Oh, it'll change. But they know they're above that. It's also an indication of how they see our legal system. Like, uh, yeah, sure, sure, yeah, come from my kid. You see why? That Whatever a police officer judge comes to me, you are never working again. No nonsense. Oh, they know they have this hierarchy of, of as a judicial system within our country. Any of us to rescue yeah. the yeah, come for them, no problem. Yeah, that's right. But of course, they're never going to. The Bush daughters had a reputation for partying. You know, I don't know who was alcohol, whatever else they did, but no, they never got in trouble. Uh, Trump kids look like they're high all the time. <laughs> but the powerful never pay a penalty. The kids going to Ivy League schools never get arrested. It's the poor that get their It's a super important issue. Vote. Vote green. They're slave stealers. Okay. Um, Let's turn the White House to a greenhouse. We've adopted that model. Here's the one thing that the great of your heart. Turning to uh, a, a devastating, serious story. Four cops in South Carolina were tragically shot, although luckily uh, they have not died as a result of the gunshot wounds. They, respond, they were responding to a domestic violence call when a suspect later opened fire on them. So let me give you the details on that. It all began uh, shortly after 10 p.m. after deputies responded to reports of a man assaulting a woman at a home outside of York, South Carolina. By the time the officers arrived to the scene, uh, the male suspect had already fled on foot. At that point, they sent out a canine unit to find him. Now, a canine, canine unit uh, did manage to find the suspect, and that was when the suspect opened fire on the first cop. Unfortunately, he did get uh, struck by bullets, but he uh, was immediately sent to the hospital, and he is luckily still alive. Uh, around 1.07 a.m., in an area near the home, a suspect opened fire and struck an officer from the K-9 unit. Two hours later, around 3 a.m., the suspect opened fire again and struck three more officers. Now, uh, the cops did shoot him. He did not die from the gunshot wounds. Uh, he is now in custody. He was identified as 47-year-old Christian Thomas McCall, and uh, he will be facing serious charges as a result. But just to give you a little bit uh about McCall's past. He had been charged with assaulting an officer, resisting arrest, and assault back in 1994. So, uh, you know, luckily no one has died from this story, but what really stood out to me was the fact that it's very common for officers to be met with violence when they're responding specifically to domestic violence calls. In fact, let me give you some of the statistics on that. The National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund released a report in 2016 which chronicled all law enforcement deaths in the line of duty between 2010 and 2014, and it showed that domestic dispute was the initial 911 call in 22% of cases, more than any other type of call. Yeah. So, uh, let's talk about a couple of different angles to the story. Uh, one is that whenever there's a political shooting, and in this case, to the best of our knowledge, it has nothing to do with any kind of politics. Because so whether it's uh, a political shooting that is uh, tied to uh, Islamic extremism or right-wing extremism, it gets a lot of coverage. The Islamic extremism, of course, gets far more coverage. Um, but uh, we just make a big deal out of it. But as usual, the media focuses on the wrong things. I get it, it's sensational and it scares us, it makes us want to watch TV. But in, in reality, cops get hurt the most in domestic violence calls. There's nothing political, there's nothing to politicize, right? So, uh, cable news isn't talking about it 24-7. But in reality, that is when they are in most danger. So we should be cognizant of that. I hope the police departments around the country are cognizant of that. Secondarily, a lot of the mass shooters have, uh, have a history of domestic violence. Uh, Sutherland Springs, Texas, the guy who shot all those uh, folks in, in a church in Texas, uh, the Las Vegas shooter, we try not to give the names after the first time we do the story because uh, we don't want to glorify these shooters, but the Ve uh, Vegas massacre, that was a guy who committed um, uh, domestic violence before, uh, the neo-Nazi in Charlottesville who ran people over, domestic violence again. You could say those are anecdotal, but you just saw the numbers that Anna gave. It is the number one uh, most likely time that an officer is going to be killed 
is responding to domestic violence. So um, I agree with you that this particular story is not political in nature, but there is um, there is a political point that I want to make, and it's something that I think a lot of people get uncomfortable with, but it's just the fact of the matter and something that should be considered. So there are organizations like the NRA and some on the right, although not all, who believe that if an individual has a past of domestic violence, that person should still have his or her constitutional rights intact, meaning that they should still have their Second Amendment rights intact and they should be able to go purchase a weapon if, if they wish to do so. And I think that that's something that we should really rethink, especially given the threat that these individuals have opposed to law enforcement and to the general public. I mean, we really need to start thinking about what standards, if any, we're ever going to have in regard to who can purchase a gun. So they say, no, that's a civil rights issue. I have my rights to uh, a gun even if I've beaten people in the past in a domestic violence situation. But wait a minute, we give away our civil rights all the time. So we all take off our shoes at an airport. That is inconvenienced. Hundreds of millions, in fact, probably in mass, billions of people. Um, I would well, argue that a TSA agent putting her hands down my pants and in my underwear, you know, during a checkpoint or whatever, is a, an unreasonable search and seizure. I don't know. Yeah, and look, I've gotten the pat down where they, uh, you know, had to go around my genitals uh, as well. So, I mean, it's not, you might say, hey, take it off your shoes is a small thing. That guy was an unsuccessful shoe bomber, never killed anyway. Oh, these, these are cops being killed. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of cops have been killed. Uh, because we didn't take away guns from people who had committed crimes that we know are the most likely to get cops shot, right? So, uh, so, and then on the on the rights at the airports, I mean, yes, it gets way worse. They the pat downs, etc. Because of why the underway bomber again, no one died. I, I want me, I want to be safe on a plane. I take planes all the time, but we all give away these massive rights. But when it comes to people who committed domestic abuse. Their rights are we can't touch, even though that actually leads to tremendous violence, not only against the women and men who are abused, but then the cops who respond. Right, and, and just think about that for a second. A, a person who has been, you know, hurting whoever's living with them, has been guilty of domestic violence, owning a gun inside the home around the individuals that he, has, uh, he or she has done domestic uh, abuse to. And, it just sounds like a really bad idea, and it's something that we should really start to reconsider. I don't know if that'll ever happen, but it's scary to think that we continuously protect these people. And if you think blue lives matter, you should care about this. And one last thing about that. This is part of the reason why cops are so jittery. Why do they shoot so quickly? Another cycle of vicious cycle of violence that is created because when they go to uh, people's houses... Even if they committed crimes in the past, even if they were violent crimes, a lot of times they still get to own a gun. So they're worried, hey, if I go to somebody's house, they're going to shoot me. But sometimes they wind up shooting four cops. So we have got to do just at least a little bit of regulation to get guns out of the hands of people who, are, who we already know are dangerous. Okay, look, we're going to take a break. I miscounted. It's the Ziz Ansari story. is actually the fourth story in, in Anna's rundown. My bad. Uh, and we're not trying to get you to watch more commercials. As you'll see, there are no commercials. <laughs> okay, just internal stuff for us. But, Everything's going to be all right. We're going to yeah, come so, back. We're going to do the story. You're going to love it. Yes, uh, or you're going to be intrigued by it. Right. This is on sorry story when we return. Welcome to the Young on a momentous day. What now? What now? <laughs> We get animated about the news. Yes, we're not the robots on TV. I actually care about the news. Guilty. Guilty, I care. The center saying is I'm going to do something unusual. I'm going to ask you a policy question. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you. That's the problem. You're the problem. Don't ever attack a Republican. Where the fuck is the liberal media? Where is it? I don't see it. No, no, no. These are all establishment guys. They love the system as it is. They're all enormously rich off the system that exists. For us, this system isn't working. So what this campaign is about is trying 
to create an economy that works not only for the people on top, but works for all of our So what's happening in the Democratic Party is what used to happen in the general election. We would have a person who represented workers and the people and the voters, and then the Republicans would represent business and corporations and Wall Street, and we'd have a freaking election. That's happening all inside the Democratic Party this time. And instead of focusing on issues that actually matter to millennial voters, for instance, we're focusing on non-issues in the country. The fear of about Muslims and terrorism. Here comes Bernie in Illinois! Tell your friends, tell your family, this is Bernie Gonzalez! Take them over! That voice in the wilderness, it created a ripple effect, which then now is a tidal wave as we stand right now. I love this shit. We're going to rock the boat. We're going to be counter-establishment. We're going to tell people the truth to the best of our abilities. Whatever and your idea. Be real with that. Most yes. care can help bring it to life online. Realistic freedom. It's incredible. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, never talk What's about sad is, uh, it just sounds like there's a lot of her feelings for a lot of different reasons. Uh, we don't want to agree with him. So he was entertained to talk to the public about his picture. But it sounds like the little guy is going to be the one that's so nice. Get quiet, guys. Because yeah. you guys share a mug. Yeah. Uh, you will take a hot cup of black. You're going to buy a lot of stuff. I'm right handed. I'm left right handed. So the results are the same area. No, no, no. I'm not that time. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
tytnetwork.com slash join to become a member. Get the full show anytime you want. No ads. All right. What's next, Anna? Okay. Over the weekend, comedian Aziz Ansari was talked about, written about, in a publication known as Babe. The author, Katie Way, recounted a story by an anonymous woman. Uh, they used a pseudonym, Grace, uh, to talk about her and her experience with Aziz Ansari. Now, the title or the headline of the piece was, I went on a date with Aziz Ansari. It turned into the worst night of my life, which kind of primes you for a devastating account of sexual misconduct, criminal behavior, something, something really bad. But as you read her account, uh, you learn that uh, Aziz Ansari was interested in having sex with her. She did not want to have sex with him. They didn't end up doing what she didn't want to do after she made it clear she didn't want to do it. And I was left wondering what the issue was. But don't take that from me. I want you guys to hear the important parts of this piece and judge for yourselves. So I'm going to go ahead and read that to you, and then we'll have a discussion. So uh, this is how it was described in the Bay piece. They walked back to his apartment building when they walked it back to when they walked back in, she complimented his marble countertops. According to Grace, Ansari turned the compliment into an invitation. He said something along the lines of, how about you hop up and take a seat? Uh, within moments, he was kissing her. In a second, his hand was on my breast. Then he was undressing her. Then he undressed himself. She remembers feeling uncomfortable at how quickly things escalated. Now, this was following a date that they had. Uh, apparently, they had met after an award ceremony. They were at some sort of party. He had some sort of old school uh, camera. She's an aspiring photographer, so she noticed that camera, and they sparked a conversation that way, and they exchanged numbers. And then later on, when they both flew back to New York, they went out on this date. And what she's uh, detailing here is the experience she had once they went to his apartment after the date. Okay. And I'm just going to give one more detail before they got to his apartment. Mm -hmm. uh, she also uh, wrote that during the dinner, in fact, I'll give two quick details. Uh, he ordered white wine and she had wanted red wine. Okay. And she also said that he uh, got the bill and paid it in a hurry and then they went back to his apartment. Um, yes. So let me give you more. The main thing was that he wouldn't let her, the main thing was that he wouldn't let her move away from him. She compared, uh, the path. That's weird. That's not the graphic I want to go to yet. Uh, okay. Let's go to the next graphic, please. Throughout the course of her short time in the apartment, she says she used verbal and non-verbal cues to indicate how uncomfortable and distressed she was. Most of my discomfort was expressed in me pulling away and mumbling. I know that my hand stopped moving at some points. I stopped moving my lips and turned cold. Now, that's a very important part of the piece because uh, Grace makes it very clear that her communication was non-verbal until the very end when she made it clear that she did not want to have sex. At that point, he was like, okay, then we're not having sex. Why don't we go back to the couch and chill with our clothes on? Okay. And so he didn't pressure her or force her to have sex. Uh, you know, after she said no, no, he complied with what she wanted. So let me give you more. Um, most of my discomfort was expressed in me pulling away and mumbling. Okay. Whether I'm sorry, didn't notice Grace's reticence or knowingly ignored it is impossible for her to say. I know I was physically giving off cues that I wasn't interested. I don't think that was noticed at all. He kept asking, so I said, next time, at meaning asking for sex. And he goes, oh, you mean second date? And I go, oh, yeah, sure. And he goes, well, if I poured you another glass of wine, would it count as our second date? He then poured her a glass of wine and handed, handed it to her. She excused herself to the bathroom soon after. Then she went back to Ansari. He asked her if she was okay. I said, I don't want to feel forced because then I'll hate you, and I'd rather not hate you. Uh, she told Babe that at first she was happy with how he reacted. He said, oh, of course it's only fun if we're both having fun. Then he said, let's chill over here on the couch. Okay. So at that point, they were hanging out on the couch, but they both still did not have their clothes on, right? Uh, 
When she sat down on the floor next to Ansari, who sat on the couch, she thought he might rub her back or play with her hair, something to calm her down. Okay. So then... Uh, so he, did, he didn't play with her hair. He didn't play with her hair. At that point, you know, he thought, all right, well, I, I don't know what the physical cues were, but he apparently uh, tried to have sex one last time. She made it super clear, don't want to have sex. At that point, that was when he told her, why don't we put our clothes on and, and chill on the couch? And at that point, they did it. Uh, as they were watching TV, a Seinfeld episode, apparently, she uh, told him, you know, all of you guys are the same. She was an expletive in there. And at that point, uh, she decided to leave. He called her a cab, and she left. And she just says that during the entire cab ride, she was crying. Um, so that was, that was the gist of the story. And the way that it was described by her was that, you know, it took her a while to validate this experience as sexual assault, but that she does feel like it was a sexual assault, even though she never verbally told him, I don't want to have sex with you until the very end. And as soon as she said that, he stopped. So I don't. Okay, so yeah. go ahead, jump in. Okay, so look, guys, it's really important in these stories to try to um, walk in the other person's foot for a second and see each other's perspective. So, and and I'm a guy, so uh, I, of course, I see the guy's perspective first. I'm keeping it real on that. And and it, back when I was a conservative, this story would have flipped me out, and I would have not bothered to see the other perspective. So now, even so, uh, you know, I'm. You're going to see where I come out on it, but let's let's look at both sides, okay? So first, let's look at uh, her point of view and the point of view of a lot of women, okay? So a lot of times, pressured into sex, pressured into sex, and and a lot of folks are number one. A lot of them got pressured into sex, and then they said no, and and it happened anyway. So for those group of women who have gone through a horrific experience, when they see a story like this, it is hard for them not to personalize it, not to feel like I was there, I was there, right? And that happened to me and then something terrible happened to me. Now in this case, it is certainly an open question as to whether something terrible happened next, right? And so I think that old me would have gotten angry at those people, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I'm asking you to do is not to get angry on either side and, and, and to say, Oh, okay, I didn't have that experience. I have met a woman who's been nonstop pressured. And I have met a woman who's been assaulted. Okay? So... I, I, I have to jump in. Um, so I am a woman. And so, you know, my natural bias, I guess, is to understand the woman's perspective, hear her out before I even consider the perspective of anyone else. So I'm being clear with you guys about what my personal bias is. Now, with that said, as a woman, I've also had my own personal experiences that were actually shockingly similar to what she experienced that night. And I never once thought of myself as a victim. And the reason why I didn't is because as soon as I made it clear, just like she did, that I was not interested in any type of sexual relationship, the guy stopped. And for me to publicly out that person while concealing my identity and potentially destroy his life, his career, I think is, to be quite honest with you, outrageous. Okay? Now, let me be clear about something. Um, Nonverbal communication is not clear, right? So what might seem like clear nonverbal communication to you might not be clear communication for the other party, which is why it's so incredibly important to verbally communicate that you're not interested, which she eventually did, and immediately after she did that, he complied, okay? Yeah, so again, but one more, and I'm going to get to Aziz aside in a second, but one more thing. A lot of women have... Uh, whether they were frightened or just didn't know what to do. They didn't feel comfortable, and next thing you know, they were having sex. Not in this case. If they had oral sex, right, and she says that he kept moving uh, her hand down uh, to her genitals, etc. Look, everybody's been involved in a thousand uncomfortable, awkward situations. But a lot of women have felt that way, and then the sex actually happened, and they felt... Uh, maybe I should have said something, maybe I shouldn't, I don't know, I got stuck in that situation, and they feel terrible about it. So when they see the story, they react in a way of like, damn it, I've been there, and they get mad. But it is important, so I understand that, but it is also important that we be fair to everyone involved and take every story on its own merits. And in this case, she didn't say she was 
She participated all along. She participated all along. And so I, I brought up the wine thing and the hair thing for a second because why are you putting that in the story? Because it's good, it loses credibility I, for yourself. I think it's important to actually give you the exact quote regarding the wine because it's it's in the very beginning of the piece and it really stood out to me too because of the wording that she utilized. I didn't get to choose. Uh, so she was asked about the drink. Uh, drank red wine. It was, it was white, she said. I didn't get to choose. I didn't go red, but it was white. It's just, there's just all sorts of little, I mean, you know, some people love to mention liquor reductions, right? And I feel like there are little, little statements made throughout that made it seem as though she had absolutely no control over the situation and she had 100% of the control. And I think that that's not a way to put it in the action. Yes, and so what there's many things more one of which is that the sisters of women have no agency. I thought that's what feminism was about, that women were fighting for. Like, you know what? You could say, hey, I prefer red wine. You could say that, right? And it goes to a state of mind here. I don't want to overemphasize the wine because it's not important, right? But it goes to a state of mind. And same with the hair. Like, why didn't he play with my hair? But you never told him to play with your hair. How? And, and, and New York Times writer, a woman, wrote, I'm a proud feminist, and Aziz Ansari cannot read your mind. And that is, that's of course the core of the argument. And that is true. So even if you're, and, and so sometimes I get in trouble when I say this, but look, if you are in an uncomfortable situation, please be strong. And I know sometimes it's hard and you, you didn't, being put in an awkward situation, being put in an uncomfortable situation is often, is not what you asked for, right? And sometimes a man is physically intimidating and you feel scared. So Whoopi Goldberg said on the view, why don't I, you just kick him in the nuts? But that, look, that's glib because a lot of times you can't do that. And so, and, and if you said that about someone who was actually date rape, that is victim blaming, right? But it is, it is also true that you should say, if you don't want to say, do something, you should say it. And because he, because he can't now, read your mind. He can't now, read your mind. And if, so if you're a woman in that situation now, I want you to for a second also put yourself in the perspective of a guy. He, it appears he had no idea. You might not believe that. You might say, oh, he should have known. He should have known my nonverbal cues, my mumbling. Those are her words, not my words. Didn't, uh, and he should have, and maybe he should have. Maybe he should, if he was a super cool guy, he would have been like, hey, you know what? She doesn't look like she's into it. And by the way, guys, if she doesn't look like she's into it, for God's sake, stop. Don't, you know, and... Not just for your sake, but for her sake. Stop, right? Because this is the world we're in now. So, and and maybe that's a slightly better thing, by the way, because maybe that avoids a lot of women being put in situations where they didn't want to be in. But in terms of blaming Aziz Ansari, it's true, he can't read your mind. If you don't want him to do something, say it instead of mumbling or hoping that he understands your nonverbal cues. So, let so me and, and by the way, she did. She said no at one point. He said, Let's put on our clothes and chill out on the couch, and they did. Yeah. You can if a guy who's when you say no, he puts on his clothes and he stops. If that guy is equally guilty as the guy who doesn't, well, then you've diminished what rape and sexual assault means, and you've done great damage to the movement, to this wonderful liberating movement of Me Too, which which all which for all these women who were suffering under sexual harassment, sexual assault. Couldn't talk about it. We just did the Eliza Dushku story yesterday. It's heart wrenching. Don't diminish that by saying a guy who said when you say no stops is equally guilty of because she used the word sexual assault. So I, I want to just to you know further solidify the fact that I'm sorry had no idea that uh, she was this bothered and uncomfortable. The next day he had sent her a text message. By the way, this was all shown to Katie Way of Babe. Um, and he wrote, it was fun meeting you last night. And then she responded, you ignored clear nonverbal cues. You kept going with advances, Grace explains. I want to make sure that you're aware so maybe the next girl doesn't have to cry on the ride home. And he responded, I'm so sad to hear this. Clearly I misread things in the moment and I'm truly sorry. By the way, that is not being used against him. So <laughs> there is an article in Law and Crime saying that since he apologized, he might have accidentally confessed to two crimes. These are really, really serious issues. So if you're going to anonymously accuse someone of sexual assault, 
you are will you if you don't understand that that could ruin his career, that could ruin his life, and people aren't going to read the entirety of the article. They're just not. They're going to see the headlines, and his picture is going to go next to Harvey Weinstein's picture. And so I don't care if you got angry at Matt Damon, and maybe I'm a bad guy for saying that, but they are not the same thing. That one guy is a monster of monsters, okay? That does all of these non-consensual things. Another guy listens to what a woman said, and now their pictures are next to one another. The headlines say that similar things. It's not right. And when you own someone's life, it, it, there are oftentimes plenty of good reasons to do it. Harvey Weinstein, Roger Hills, Kevin Spacey, the list goes on and on and on. But I think you have a moral duty to be take a little care in that process. And now I don't know. I I hope you do. Um, based on my reading of the story, I hope he doesn't face legal consequences. But if we're going in this direction, and by the way, now it makes guys reluctant to say that to apologize and say that they did the wrong thing and try to see it your way. I, mean, I, I think I think what's lacking in this in this discussion, and I think the reason why it's lacking is because people are afraid to just come forward and say it. But if if we get blowback, then we get blowback. We're not having a nuanced discussion at all when it comes to this movement. We are not differentiating between uh, various types of sexual misconduct. We are not differentiating between uh, a bad date from what happened with Harvey Weinstein. We're not differentiating any of it. We're just kind of lumping everything together into one group uh, because, you know, in some cases, women felt slighted. In some cases, women were raped. And you can't compare those two things. Well, you can't. You should compare those two things. But you can't lump them into the same group. And I think that's the big problem right now. And anyone who has the audacity to speak out against that, that unnuanced you know, discussion that's taking place in the country, gets demonized. And I think that that, unfortunately, stops an important conversation from happening. You know, destroying the careers of people who haven't actually committed crimes who haven't actually sexually assaulted people. That is a very scary world to live in. And I'm seeing things happen now for political reasons, with people with political agendas, making all sorts of crazy accusations. And that stuff really concerns me because it does damage on so many different components of this issue. And it especially minimizes cases of sexual assault and rape when you lump everything together like this. I actually think Ashley Banfield had a, a great point about that. I want to go to that, and then when we come back, I want to discuss one last thing, which is cultural difference in America. So I think millennials are seeing things differently, or some portion of millennials are seeing things differently, so differently than I would say, quote, unquote, the rest of us, that it, it's, it's fascinating. So first, let's go to Ashley Banfield making a similar point to Anna. The Me Too movement has righted a lot of wrongs, and it has made your career path much smoother. And here's where I'm guessing it's going to be a long career path. You're 23. What a gift. Yet you looked that gift horse in the mouth and chiseled away at that powerful movement with your public accusation. And I'm going to repeat this because it's important. If you were sexually assaulted, go to the cops. If you were sexually harassed, jeopardizing your work, Speak up and speak out loud. But by your own descriptions, that is not what happened. You had an unpleasant date and you did not leave. That is on you. And all the gains that have been achieved on your behalf and mine are now being compromised with the allegations that you threw out there. And I'm going to call them reckless and hollow. I cannot name you publicly and sentence you to a similar career hit, as I'm sorry, because you chose to remain anonymous. Lucky you, that as you grow in your photography career, I really do hope that you remember what you did to someone else's career, all because of that bad date that was not a sexual assault, that was not sexual harassment by your description. And I hope the next time you go on a bad date, you stand up sooner, you smooth out your dress, and you bloody well leave. Because the only sentence that a guy like that deserves is a bad case of blue balls not a Hollywood black ball. So, uh, look, it does damage to the Me Too movement because it allows so many guys, and I look, I know the guy's perspective. It allows a lot of guys to go, ah, I knew it was all BS from the beginning. Oh, that's terrible. It's not BS. Roger Hills would take out his penis and chase a woman around the, his office. Matt Lauer had the button to 
and lock the door behind them. I can go on and on. Harvey Weinstein would literally barge into their house and rip off their clothes and rape them. And and this is what they dealt with at work, at work. And and it was just. And that's why I keep saying the more the movement has liberated millions of women. So I, I this does this to, in our opinion does damage to that movement. And and uh, and by the way, it also pushes a lot of people to the right wing. They go, if that's the progressive position, I don't want any part of that. And that and here we are as progressives saying, no, it is not necessarily the progressive position. And so one one more thing, and maybe it's I'm a little older, and the person who wrote about this at, for at the Atlantic is a woman who says, look, she's a proud feminist. She went through a couple of sexual assaults, but she's a little older. For millennial women, apparently, according to Economist YouGov uh, poll. 25% of millennial each American women think asking someone for a drink is harassment. And more than a third say that if a man compliments a woman's looks, it is harassment. Not at work, just period. I don't know how we're going to get along if that's the new standard. And um, But I, it, that's, that's a cultural difference. And so they view the world com it, obviously in a very different way. And they don't understand us. They're like, how could you not see that, that we are being pressured and we are being Asked to do things we don't want to do. And this is, if I like the guy, then a yes, great. But if I don't, it's terrible, right? So we have to try to understand each other. And there's going to be a lot of hurt feelings and a lot of misunderstanding and miscommunication and probably a lot of anger before we get to a place where we can be joined again as one community. Uh, but right now, there is vast differences among us. And I think that this is a case that is beginning to have people say, you know, this, this might have gone too far. Yeah, and, um, you know, it's it's really hard to articulate this, but I, as a woman, I'm starting to become increasingly irritated with people deciding for me that I'm a victim. And I'm not a victim. Um, I am not uh, someone who anyone should feel sorry for. I get to decide. I get to decide when I'm a victim. I get to decide when I work in a hostile work environment or anything like that. No one gets to decide that for me. And I feel like I'm seeing a lot of that right now in the media that I don't appreciate. So, Okay, we're out of time. Uh, I, I hope we did uh, justice to that issue. And, uh, and uh, stay with us. We've got Rebel Headquarters coming up next. Some great progressive candidates. And then we'll do a post-game afterwards as well. All right. Bye-bye.
today. And then uh, I want to tell you about one quick news event in a second. Uh, also remember, uh, we're getting a lot of guests from you guys now, uh, rebelhq at tytnetwork.com to suggest guests, uh, I suppose topics as well, but certainly events. So if there's a rally being held or, uh, or protests or anything along those lines, or a great candidate you know of in the country, uh, and it could be national or local, it doesn't matter, rebelhq at tytnetwork.com. Okay, now, let me tell you about one quick thing. So Wolfpack is on the march, and uh, they're fighting a lot of different states now. Uh, at the beginning of the year, a lot of the state legislatures go back to work, and that is when Wolfpack needs them to pass a resolution to call for a convention to get money out of politics, okay? So right now, we need uh, your help in that if you're in the state of Connecticut. So uh, there is going to be a Connecticut uh, State House meeting. It's going to be on Wednesday, January 24th at 1 p.m., uh, and... Uh, these legislators are greatly affected by actual citizens of those states coming out and making a difference. I've seen it happen in states that we've passed, Rhode Island, California, when you, New Jersey, when you, Illinois, we had a mountain army in Illinois. So when you uh, guys go up there, I remember in, in New Jersey, a legislator was like, I've never seen anything like this. Hundreds of young people who came to actually get money out of politics. It's amazing and it makes a huge difference and Connecticut is so close, we can win there. So please be the person that makes the difference. So if you want to know how you can participate or get more information, go to john at wolf-pack.com. By the way, you guys are the ones that helped to hire John, and he has been hired. And so now he's busy at work uh, organizing at the state level. Uh, so thank you for all the people who went and donated and became members of Wolfpack. Uh, that allowed uh, John to uh, come in-house and, and work with uh, uh, Wolfpack and getting money out of politics. So different times, different states will be up. Right now, Connecticut's up. Let's go fight and, and let's go win. They, they want to make sure that you don't get energized and you don't go to fix the system. But if you do and if you fight hard, you can. Every time we won, whether it's civil rights, women's rights, gay rights, it's because people got up and, and fought. And, and got those improbable victories. And in Connecticut, it is actually very likely to happen. But we need you guys there to bring it that last extra mile. So john at wolf-pack.com to figure out how you can participate. Okay, now let me go to our guests. Uh, first up is Dottie Nygaard. Dottie Nygaard, thank you for joining us at Rebel Headquarters. Great to have you here. Hello. Thank you so much, Cenk. I'm honored to be here. Oh, thank you. Um, so Dottie's running in the California's 10th District. Uh, and she is a nurse. Uh, we talked to her before, um, uh, but I wanted to check in on your race and see how you're doing. Um, I saw this quote of yours that I actually want to start with. We're going to talk about healthcare, obviously. It's an issue that you care a lot about. Living wage, these are all important. But on today's uh, Young Turk show, we're talking about uh, marijuana. And, uh, and I, so I wanted to go to this quote from you. You said, in the emergency room in 30 years, I can tell you I've never seen a cardiac arrest or a respiratory arrest from pot. <laughs> <laughs> so give us a sense as a nurse who's been in the emergency room for 30 years, in the, in the scope of the different drugs, whether it's prescription painkillers, alcohol, pot, or the harder drugs, heroin, meth, etc., where does pot rank in, in there? You know, Tank, it's, it's so amazing that this plant that we have had uh, for the last 30 years, 40 years we've been fighting against, classified as the same class as heroin. Um, you know, it, it, I remember when I was growing up, there was a push to start to decriminalize it and legalize it. And we've come quite a way, but we still have so far to go. We need to just legalize it, get it across the board. There's so many medicinal properties with pot. I'm just a firm believer that it's not going anywhere. And, you know, it does show that it has great uh, capacity to, you know, fight off seizures, fight off nausea for chemo, fight off um, headaches and anxiety. And this is, this is, uh, <laughs> This is the age we're in, so you know I am a I'm a strong supporter of legalizing marijuana. Um, look how much it's contributed to both Colorado and Oregon, and let's just make it happen because it is not the devastating drug as opioids or heroin or the fentanyl that is uh, ravishing our communities. It is of anything 
a calmer um, type of medication that you know makes makes you more happy and hungry than anything. Yeah. You know, they, they you'll you'll end up you know fighting over the Dorito bags and you know really causing any type of, of um, you know strong um, you know conflict or or. Uh, you know, any type of medical issues. So, yes, I'm a strong supporter of legalizing marijuana and using it for what its truly purpose is. And so you're running in California, but I want the audience to understand that uh, the, the story that we covered earlier on the Young Turks was about how they need votes in Congress to make sure that the Trump administration uh, does not interfere with uh, states' rights uh, on this issue. So as good as the laws are in California that we just passed, and it was the citizens who passed it, if there's not enough Congress people to support that, the feds can actually come in and raid and invalidate those laws. So every congressperson matters. And in your district, uh, you've actually got a Republican, but he won by less than 5% last time. Uh, his name is Jeff Denham. So it's a very winnable district. Um, so let me ask you a little bit about him. Um, how, you know, in California, I don't know if he claims to be a moderate Republican or not. How often does he vote with Trump? Almost 99%. Um, Jeff Denham is actually more of a Tea Party Republican. He is all aligned with Trump. He's pretty much kind of like a rubber stamp. So, yes, he has uh, promised at one uh, turn uh, not to do anything to affect the health care, and the next day he votes against the health care. So he's pretty much booted so many people off of health care in our district. He says that he's a champion for immigration and for the DACA, yet he can't even rally his own colleagues to get this DACA bill passed. So, um, yes, he's a, he's a very... Um, He's a very, you know, uh, in, uh, he's a challenge. He's a challenge. He's not He's not one here that stands up for the people. And we really need to have a people's candidate in there that knows what the people are up against. And I feel that that's me. I really see what people want, and I hear them, and I listen to them, and I want to be that voice for them. So Dottie's uh, with the National Nurses United, which uh, I would argue is the most progressive union there is in the country. Uh, so uh, in a district that close, I think she has an excellent chance. But Denim has a one and a half million dollar war chest, of course, from corporate facts. Dottie doesn't take corporate facts. So I just want to show you guys the links real quick on how you can help Dottie. Uh, and I will, of course, have these uh, in the description box below on YouTube and in the comment section on Facebook. So if you can donate your time, wonderful. Uh, our volunteer armies are going to wipe these guys off the map. Uh, but if you can't donate the time, definitely donate uh, small dollar uh, donations or as much as you can afford to make sure that these progressives have a real fighting chance to win. So let's let's talk about the state of your race, Dottie. Uh, I imagine there are uh, others in the race. Uh, how do you stand uh, among the different Democrats? You know, right now, Tank, um, I'm going to just throw out there that I'm really excited about this race because yesterday I received the news that I had the endorsement from CB10, Our Revolution. Um, so very pleased with that, knowing that this is our chance to push progressive values. This is what we are all up against. And with the candidates that are in the race right now, I will say I am the most progressive that is going to stand up for those values. We have every Democrat across the, the spectrum um, and and it is it is um, it is a challenge but I'm going to say I am that progressive voice that is going to push for really what we want to see long term that we have to get money out of politics that we have we need health care we need to get tuition free college we have to build up our infrastructure we have we need to have peace and not so much war. So um, I am a very strong progressive and I am going to push with every ounce of my might for those values to come into this district. Wouldn't it be amazing? Join me. <laughs> Wouldn't it be amazing, you know, as I talk to all of you guys who are running without corporate PAC money um, and are real Americans, wouldn't it be amazing if we had someone, people who were nurses, who then said, hey, you know what, I care about my community, and I'm going to go fight for them in Congress and actually represent them. I just, I love that idea. I, I want it to come true, and I think you're right on the doorstep, and people need to help in all these different districts to, to push over that step. And we don't have to keep begging corporate Democrats to give us morsels off the table. We're going to actually elect real Americans, real progressives, 
to do that, and, and Dottie certainly qualifies there. I, I want to ask you about one more issue. Look, I, you, you're for Medicare for all. You're obviously for getting money out of politics. Everybody understands that. Um, I, I want to talk about wages a little bit, though. So what's your stance on, on a living wage? I'm a strong supporter of raising our minimum wage. 15 is a good start, but yes, we need livable wages. I'm a strong supporter of unions, and that is what has built up this incredible country. So I'm going to actually fight tooth and nail against right to work because we need to stand in solidarity as unions to make sure that we keep that fabric of our democracy intact, that we can have uh, livable wages, great working environment, safe working conditions, and that we do consider a value on the worker. We need to bring that back because we have long, we have long been so oppressed and suppressed by so many corporations and so many employers that it's time for workers to really unite in this fight for livable wages. Look, $7.25 is somehow unbelievably still the minimum wage at the federal level. That's uh, a little over $15,000 a year for working full-time, 40 hours a week. That's poverty. Uh, almost every week. But even if we, Dottie's right, even if we get to $15, that's a little over $31,000. It's not asking for too much. That, that should be the beginning of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Imagine having representatives who represent you and fight for that. Uh, I think Dottie Nygaard is one of those. So thank you for joining us, Dottie, today at Rebel Headquarters. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Chank. I really appreciate it. All right, everybody. And we will, yeah, we will fight for progressive values, believe me, hard and strong. I love that. We fight strong for progressive values. Don't forget the links down below to help Dottie Nygaard. Thank you, Dottie. We'll be right back.
You know, I decided uh, I should clarify one thing for you guys who watch the show regularly. Uh, if you're watching it live, you'll often hear me talking about the description box below or comment section on Facebook. That's for when we put these interviews up uh, on, on YouTube and Facebook later. For you guys watching live, obviously that's where we're putting up the graphics. And if you can't write it down quick enough, it's okay. Just Google their names and you'll, you'll get it, you know. Nine out of ten times, but I just wanted you guys to not be confused. Like, where the hell is the description box about watching live on tytnetwork.com, right? So, anyway, I, I think you guys get it. Uh, you're far more savvy than I am on these issues. Anyways, uh, let's go to the next guest. Uh, Bob Solomon is joining us. He's running as Democrat in uh, Pennsylvania's 18th district. He's got a unique race. And, and Bob, uh, welcome to Rebel Headquarters. And I'm really going to leave it to you to describe what in the world's going on over there. Um, I get that Tim Murphy is resigning because he tried to get his mistress to get an abortion. That's the Republican there, right? Uh, so that means we've got a special election, right? Yes, yes, uh, that's exactly what it means. Uh, last uh, September, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, a stellar example of the value of a free press and a democracy, broke a scandal in which Representative Murphy was revealed uh, to be a participant in a rather shocking bit of hypocrisy. And uh, he resigned in disgrace in fairly short order after the story broke. So under Pennsylvania election law, the governor has uh, scheduled a special election, uh, which is uh, on March 13th. And the Democratic and Republican Party establishments uh, both selected candidates um, uh, through processes that they determine for themselves. The uh, Democratic Party establishment um, is composed primarily of people who um, don't believe that a progressive Democrat can win this election, and they uh, chose someone who uh, does not have a record in politics and does not have uh, any established positions on issues and for the most part uh, is rather uh, clearly avoiding taking positions on matters of policy. Clearly, it's the, the party establishment's uh, view and that of his campaign and his handlers that, uh, that that's really the best approach. So I, I want to get to your role in this in a second. So Murphy resigning special election, that's clear. Um, how did the Democrats decide who was going to run against the Republican in the special election? That's the part I'm a little confused on. Ah. Well, uh, there are Democratic committees on the, um, I guess you would call it the municipal level, townships, boroughs, and so forth throughout the 18th Congressional District. The total number of people who are eligible to serve on these Democratic committees is over 1,400. The number who actually currently fill spots on those committees is 900-some. The number of people who turned up for an endorsement convention, which was held on November 19th, was about 550. Uh, those were people from Democratic committees across the district, and those of us who were in this race did everything that we could within the period of several weeks prior to this endorsement convention to connect with members of Democratic committees. We all went to numerous meetings and candidate forums and uh, uh, spoke to them and talked to them about ourselves and our positions, and then they got together on uh, November 19th and heard uh, five-minute speeches from each of the candidates and then uh, engaged in a balloting process um, that uh, determined what their recommendation to the uh, state Democratic Party was going to be. So that's a unique situation where there is no primary, the voters don't get to decide, the Democratic delegates decided. Uh, exactly. Okay, so Bob, where does that leave you? Well, it actually leaves me on the same trajectory on which I started when I filed with the FEC early last summer. My plan was to seek the Democratic nomination via the primary, which is going to be held in mid-May, and uh, that's still where I'm headed. Uh, my campaign is in the process of, of uh, uh, vigorous fundraising efforts at this point, as you might surmise. Uh, it's a grassroots campaign relying on individual donations, and we're uh, 
uh, working hard on uh, on raising money, and then next month uh, there will be a petition drive to gather signatures uh, on petitions uh, to qualify to be on the ballot in May. Under Pennsylvania election law, there's a period of about three weeks for gathering signatures on petitions, so we'll be doing that, and then the plan is to be on the ballot for the Democratic primary in mid-May. So, uh, by the way, we'll put up the links here uh, if you uh, want to help Bob Solomon, and they'll always be in the description box on YouTube and comment section on Facebook. And uh, so, Bob, you're not in the special election. You're just going forward exactly as you were planning before Murphy uh, resigned uh, to be in the election in, in November of 2018. Uh, obviously, there's a primary before that. So even if the Democrat uh, picked by the establishment wins, you'll be in a primary against them in June. Is that right? Uh, the, the primaries in May. Oh. Yes, when I, when, I, uh, when I filed uh, last summer, uh, my, uh, my intention was to run in this uh, election as a progressive Democrat. And what I found out during the process throughout 2017 was that uh, I was the one and only person seeking the Democratic nomination as a progressive, and that's still true. The person chosen by the Democratic Party establishment is not a progressive, uh, uh, but uh, there will be someone on the ballot in the primary in May who is a progressive, and you're looking at him. So, Bob, you're, you're a doctor, and you've been uh, specializing in emergency medicine for 32 years, and you've got your progressive platform. Um, the conventional wisdom is that people say, oh, no, in a district this heavily Republican, and it is, uh, it uh, favors Republicans by at least 11 points. You should not be as progressive. You should try to get the Republican voters in that district. And that, and that's why the guy running it right now, you would argue, is wishy-washy. So what's your thesis for why those voters will vote for a progressive candidate instead? Well, frankly, I don't necessarily expect people who are registered Republicans who always vote Republican to vote for a progressive Democrat. But the fact is that even though this district is pegged at R plus 11 by Charlie Cook and Larry Sabato, there are actually 70,000 more registered Democrats than Republicans in the district. So then the question is, well, why is the district voting Republican? And I think it's really pretty simple. Uh, first, unfortunately, Democratic voter turnout tends to be not quite up to snuff uh, relative to Republican voter turnout. Second, there are Democrats who have historically been uh, voting uh, in a manner that, that people such as you and I recognize as being against their self-interest. And uh, I think it's possible to get people who've been voting Republican to understand that when someone who is a regular guy or gal votes Republican, he or she is voting against self-interest and to come around to an understanding that it's time to stop doing that. All right, one final question for you, Bob. Uh, so you're a doctor for all these decades. Uh, why uh, decide to run for Congress? Well, I've spent a lot of time over the years uh, engaged in political advocacy, talking to folks on Capitol Hill and elsewhere in D.C., people in regulatory agencies about health policy, and I have very strong feelings that have developed over the period of my career that we must stop being the only country in the first world that doesn't have universal health care, that doesn't guarantee access to quality health care to everyone on our soil just as a matter of being here in the United States. It's time to join the rest of the first world. Uh, we should have done it a long time ago, long past time to do it. And I think it's important to have some people on Capitol Hill among the 535 elected members of the House and Senate who really understand their health care system and who have expertise in health policy. Right now, the number of people of whom that is true is very tiny, and I think it's, it's time to, to send somebody to Capitol Hill who can offer that expertise and help to shape the debate over how to reform our absurdly fragmented non-system of financing health care in this country. All right, Bob Solomon running for Congress in Pennsylvania's 18th District. Thank you for joining us at Rebel Headquarters. Thank you very much for having me on. Great. I like to hear from these rebels across the country. They say he should run. He's going to do it anyway. 
All right, uh, we're going to take a quick break here. If you're a member, don't worry. We're coming right back with uh, Anna and the post game. TYTnetwork.com slash join to become a member. All right, we'll see you there. 